Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our morning devotions. And I'm excited to be able to share with you from God's Word. Also to report to you that uh, we have begun the work in earnest of renovating our educational space upstairs in anticipation of our return to um, uh, actually our resumption of traditional children's Sunday school. And uh, we're looking forward to that uh, in the month of October. And uh, barring anything unforeseen, that's our plan. And we're going to be doing a lot of work up there over the next three or four weeks. And uh, we appreciate the help of volunteers, have some volunteers coming down today and uh, had some volunteers last night. And uh, it's really a, a huge project. Uh, in fact, we uh, received a construction dumpster today and we're gonna fill it up uh, over the next week or two uh, with uh, a good deal of construction uh, debris and uh, we're tearing out the old stairs on the front and back side of the building and rebuilding the stairs and all the debris is gonna go in there. A lot of old junky furniture that's just been uh, in storage rooms and in closets and corners is going to be thrown out. And uh, we're just excited about uh, being able to give that a facelift for ministry uh, in our educational area to the children primarily, but we have some adult classes that meet in those areas. And uh, uh, we're going to be painting up, fixing up, new flooring, in some cases lighting, New, new mini blinds, new trim work, uh, just a lot of work going to be going into it. And so be in prayer and then pray about having a part in contributing uh, to that great work. Um, it was a blessing to my heart to have a visit from a lady in our church yesterday. And uh, she said that she had given a, a gift. It was all that she had. But uh, when she heard what was being undertaken, she just felt impressed of the Lord uh, to do something more and uh, she said I didn't have any money but uh, I, I went down to Home Depot and I used my credit card and bought a thousand dollars worth of gift cards and uh, I want to give those uh, for the use of the construction project and uh, it was just with great joy in her heart and what a wonderful spirit um, and, and, I, and I would tell you honestly we've outlined a whole list of things that that probably need to be taken care of and if I told you how much it costs, you may not believe me, but um, as we have been getting bids uh, to do the work around here, we, we're discovering that um, for a building of this size and this old, there's a great deal that needs to be done and it's not cheap. And we don't wanna do just uh, things cheaply because then you just have to turn around in a couple years and do it all over again. We wanna do it the right way. And uh, so uh, we're just asking the Lord to provide for our every need, uh, just the flooring costs upstairs alone are gonna range uh, in the neighborhood of $30,000. And uh, that's a tremendous sum of money, as well as the rebuilding of these steps, that's gonna uh, be $10,000. And so uh, we have roof work and AC work. We have uh, seating that needs to be purchased. We need to replace the flooring in our fellowship hall. And uh, this isn't just something that uh, we think would be a good idea. It's something that's needful. And one of the things that I, I would just simply say is that we're living in a different day as far as church work is concerned. And that is because of COVID-19 to some extent, because now the standard uh, for our church work is not just that it be clean, but that it be sanitary. And when you have an older building and uh, you've had a lot of traffic on carpets. It may be clean and it may be bacteria free, but if it doesn't look like it, then people surmise that it's not. And so we need it not only to be clean and sanitary, but to look clean and sanitary. That's one of the things we're doing. And we want to absolutely do our best for Jesus and be a great testimony for those that come through the doors of Freeway Baptist Church. So uh, please pray and please have a part in this. You can go on PushPay on the church app or you can give through text. You can give through the church website, freewaybaptist.org and uh, through the giving portal there. And uh, when you go on there to give, there's a drop-down menu of things you can designate to. 
And this offering is called the Lighthouse Offering because we want this place to continue to be a lighthouse for the gospel until Jesus comes. And folks, people need the Lord and they need a church in this area um, perhaps more than ever before. And so uh, think of the, these things and pray together with us. I want you to turn in your Bible this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 to an old familiar place in the word of God to many, but yet perhaps a not so familiar uh, a message on this. Uh, but uh, I want to talk to you about David and Goliath. Now, how many of you, 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 you learned that one when you were in Sunday school as a child? All right, I see that hand. Okay, see that hand, Brother Daniel. <laughs> and uh, uh, many of you, uh, you know this very well, but I want you to, together with me today, uh, think about uh, some of the things that we can draw principally uh, from this victory uh, that was wrought by the hand of God through his servant David uh, over the Philistines. And as we consider this, I want us to just go to the Lord in prayer and, and just to ask God's blessing upon this time that we have together. Let's pray now. Lord God, thank you for this opportunity to open the word of God and to uh, communicate your truth to your people. God, I pray that you would help us to have the mind of Christ. Lord, I pray that we would discern your truth. God, I pray for Freeway Baptist Church that you would allow us to continue to be the gospel light that you have called us to be in this area. Lord, there are multiplied thousands of people within just a few miles radius of this place. And they need you desperately and they need a church here to just lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to, to remain that until you come. Lord, we just give ourselves to you now. Fill us with thy spirit, we pray in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. I wish I had time to read all of the passages uh, related to the story of David and Goliath, but time was kind of uh, scarce for us this morning, and I want to give you some things, and I want to just uh, bring a Bible study to you out of this passage entitled, In Case You Want to Be Used by God. Just in case you want to be used by God. Here's some things that we need to consider. Now, the Bible tells us that the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Soko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Soko and Ezekah and Episdemim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array. Now, you know the story that Goliath was the champion of the Philistines, and he was uh, almost 10 feet tall. He was massive, bigger than any man uh, that we have ever set eyes upon. I'm certain that he weighed easily uh, 400 pounds and was probably very muscular. He was an imposing character, and he fought for the Philistines against the people of God. And as the Philistines encamped on one side of this valley and the children of Israel on the other, he would come out every morning and every evening, as you know, and he would cry out and call upon the children of Israel there in their encampment to send out their champion and to fight with him. And he said uh, in verse number eight, uh, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I uh, a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And as you know, the men of Israel, they were afraid. They were hiding in their tents, man. They had their pillows pulled over their heads and they were hoping that uh, nobody called upon them to go down and fight against this giant 
for there wasn't a man in Israel that believed there was anything that he could do against this giant Goliath. But we know that Saul, even himself, uh, who was head and shoulders above all the men of Israel was there and he, he should have been the one to go down and fight against the giant. Uh, he was the natural choice, but he was afraid as well. And the Bible uh, says that when Saul and all Israel heard the, those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son of the Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among them for, for an old man in the days of Saul. Verse 13, and the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him, Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest of the three eldest, was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. So we know David is going to find his way to the battlefront eventually, but there's some backstory that leads up to this. And we know that God chose him to fight against Goliath, to do something mighty for God. And in case you want to be used for God, consider how God used David. The Bible says David went and returned in verse 15 from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these 10 loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these 10 cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to a trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid." I want to tell you something. The first thing that we find about David, who was chosen of the Lord to do something mighty for God, was that he was faithful. Well, he was faithful to do the job that his father had given him. He was a shepherd, a keeper of the flocks, and he went back home and he was caring for the sheep, and his father called for him and said, I have a mission for you. I want you to go to the battlefront and deliver these provisions to your brothers and to the captain over the army of Israel, and then get a report on how things are going. Bring that back to me. Well, you see, the reason why he was chosen is because he was faithful. The Bible tells us that uh, he was tending the flocks, and when his father asked him to go in verse 20. It says, David rose up early in the morning. Uh, he didn't sleep in till noon and pack a lunch and, and you know, call all his friends. And then wh whenever he felt like it, he, he, he got ready to go. No, he rose up early in the morning and then he didn't just leave the sheep in the field. He had somebody that he appointed to watch over them. And he went, the Bible says, as Jesse had commanded him. So he was faithfully carrying out the tasks that God had given him to do. Now, I'm sure you're like me. You've heard it said that if you have some have a job that really needs to get done, um, give it to a busy person. 
somebody who's actively doing what they're supposed to do, who's busily engaged. Sometimes we look for people and say, well, they're not very busy, let's give them something to do. Well, maybe the reason why they're not very busy is because they're not faithfully doing the things that they would ought to be doing. Uh, you know what, you wanna find uh, somebody to do something, find a woman that has a clean house and well-behaved kids. And uh, you, you know what, she's gonna set her heart and her mind to that because that's just the way that she's wired. Uh, find a guy uh, who uh, is, is organized, who has a workshop uh, that is spit spot and organized. You know what, that's probably gonna be a guy that's gonna do a proper job who's faithfully doing what he's supposed to do already. We want to, on face, do great exploits for God. We say, well, I want to do something mighty for the Lord. And, uh, and yet we're not doing the small things that he's already given us to do. Do you know the Bible says that he that is faithful in little will be faithful also in that which is much. You want much from the Lord. You want to do much for God. Be faithful in the little that God has put in your hand. Be faithful with the sheep that God has called you to tend. Be faithful to rise up early and seize the day and do the task that the Father has given you to do. Here the Father, Jesse, said, here's what I want you to do, David. And he knew that he would do it because David was faithful in the little things that he had been given to do. And then he was obedient to go. Uh, he didn't say, well, you know, why don't you ask somebody else? I hear there's a lot of danger in that area and I, I'd really rather not go. I'll just take care of the sheep. You send one of the servants. If they get killed, huh, big deal. No, he didn't say that. He said, look, I'll go. He was obedient to do what God had called him to do. If you wanna do something great for God, just in case you want to do something great for God, be found faithfully doing what God has called you to do. And then when the call comes, be obedient to the voice of the Father. I think about D.L. Moody, who built the great Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois, and how that um, when he felt uh, when he felt the call of God upon his life, he, he surrendered uh, to the Lord after his uh, conversion, and he had been a, a cobbler. And he went to the leadership of the church and said, I'd like to be involved in serving the Lord somehow. And, and what happened was uh, they, they said, well, we'll give you a, a, a boy's Sunday school class. And so he had a, I believe it was a fifth and sixth grade boy's Sunday school class. And you know, he just started teaching those boys and reaching out in Chicago and, and he had a burden to reach them. And he got an old buckboard and a wagon and, and a team of horses. And he began to go all over Chicago and, and fill up that wagon with boys and bring them to church and give them the gospel. And pretty soon there was more fifth and sixth grade boys in the church than all the other people put together. And and uh, the, we know the rest of the story, how that he became a great evangelist for God, literally shook a continent for Jesus Christ, was mightily used of the Lord. Why? Because he was faithful in reaching little boys. Then God made him a leader of men. But it was not before he was faithful, not before he chose to be obedient to do that which God placed in his hand to do. But let me say something to you. Anytime you attempt to do something for God, you're going to be confronted with opposition. Now we see that uh, the men of Israel fled from him. And uh, in verse 25, the men of Israel said, uh, have you seen this man that has come up surely to defy Israel? Is he come up? And it shall be that the man who killeth him the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men and stood by him saying, what shall be done to this man that killed this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. 
And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You see, whenever you're faithful and whenever God calls you and you're obedient and you set about to do something great for God, someone will always be critical of it. Now I'm going to tell you something. Oftentimes the criticism will come from a place that you least expected. It'll come from someone that, man, you just never anticipated uh, would be as critical of you as they are. In this case, it wasn't his old school buddies uh, that uh, looked down on him. In this case, it wasn't a stranger standing by. In this case, it was his oldest brother that he looked up to and that he loved, that he'd come to show kindness to, that he uh, was coming to be in support of. And Eliab, his oldest brother, is now criticizing him. I'm going to tell you something. You will always be criticized when you attempt to do something great for God. It's going to come. Now, I just want to tell you that um, it, it, it sometimes is going to come from people that hurt your feelings, from a brother, from a sister, from someone that you look up to, someone that you're hoping will encourage you, might be just prodded by the devil himself to say a, a negative, critical word to you. It doesn't mean that they're now your enemy. Just know that whenever you attempt to do something for God, criticism will come. Um, and I've, I've heard it said that if you don't want to be criticized, if you never want to have somebody criticizing you, then uh, know nothing, say nothing, do nothing, believe nothing, attempt nothing. Pretty much if you know nothing, you say nothing, you believe nothing, you attempt nothing. Uh, and listen, you're not going to be criticized you don't say anything, if you don't believe anything, if you don't attempt anything great for God, just sit on the sidelines. Nobody's going to have a problem with you then. And, uh, and so, but whenever you attempt to do great things for God, just mark it down. Somebody's not going to like it. Somebody's going to have something to say about it. But what did David do? You see, his brother was unkind to him, tried to belittle him in front of others. You think of that. And what does the Bible say in verse number 29? David said, what have I now done? What did I do? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. What did David do? He turned away from the criticism. He didn't allow it to deter him from what God was putting in his heart to do. He didn't allow it to get him down and to say, well, if that's what it is to be your brother, then I, I disown you. He didn't say, well, if that's what your Christianity is like, I want nothing to do with it. He didn't say, well, if that's how you guys want to be, then nuts to you, then the Philistines can just have you. No, he said, look, is there not a cause? And he turned away from the criticism. When people criticize you for attempting great things, things for God, just turn away from the criticism. Now, folks, I'm just, I, I'm going to say this. Uh, listen, there may be a time where you're still in the deliberative process when maybe you need to be seeking counsel, okay? And someone gives you counsel that you don't want to hear. You know what? You're going to be inclined to think, well, they're being critical of me. No, they may be giving you good counsel. That, that's not what I'm referring to here. You see, Eliab tried to belittle his brother in front of a crowd. He put him down. He belittled him. He was critical of him for taking a stand. 
So someone that loves you and is honestly trying to help you that says something to you that maybe runs against the grain of what you think you should do, um, don't, don't look at them as the enemy. They may not even be uh, in their spirit thinking that they're being critical. They may in their spirit think they're being helpful to you. And so you need to have the wisdom and discernment from the Lord to be able to discern between whether someone is criticizing you to hurt you and put you down or if they're providing some constructive advice that just runs against the grain of what your flesh wants to do. There's a difference. So think about that. But you know what? David said, is there not a cause? And do you know what he was telling them there? Listen, there's a cause here worth fighting for. And I'm going to tell you something. This cause, the cause of Jesus Christ is worth living for. The cause of Jesus Christ is worth fighting for. The cause of Jesus Christ is worth laying down our life for. Jesus laid his life down for us. He doesn't ask us to go into the field of battle and die for him. He asks us to live for him. And so there is a cause worth fighting for. And we know that David went to Saul. Someone said, hey, there's a young uh, man here that uh, wants to go and fight the Philistine. And so Saul encountered him. And we know that Saul tried to give David uh, his armor. And you know what? Uh, David began to tell Saul, he said in verse 26, uh, uh, rather uh, verse 34, um, David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. The servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. You know what? David had a conviction, and here's what it is. He said, the Lord delivered me out of the hand of the lion and the bear, and he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. So do you know what? David had this conviction that my God is able. Do you believe God is able? What is he able to do? Well, the Bible says in Philippians 3, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we might ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. But not only is God able, but I want you to know that God is able to use me. David said, uh, he will deliver me. God will use me. Listen, Saul said, take my armor. Da David tried to put the armor on and it didn't fit. You know what? He said, I don't need the armor. God will use me as I am. So say this together with me. God is able. Then say, God is able to use me. Say it. God is able to use me. And then you know what David said? God is able to use me as I am. Say that with me. God is able to use me as I am. We don't have to go get more armament. We don't have to get a better army. We don't have to have more training to be used of the Lord. If God is calling you to it, then he will equip you for it. And understand, if you want to be used mildly for the Lord, just in case you want to do something for God, be faithful, be obedient, understand criticism is going to come, turn away from it, and have the conviction that my God is able, and my God is able to use me, and what's more, my God is able to use me as I am. Well, you say, I've, I've, had, I've got a jaded past. I've got a criminal history. I've got uh, all kinds of things I'm not proud of. Well, join the crowd. <laughs> Those are the people that God can well use. Understand that God used a number of people. Mary Magdalene was a demon-possessed woman. Understand that the apostle Paul was a persecutor. 
of the church. Understand that there were unseemly people like Matthew, who was a publican, not even allowed to go uh, into the temple. God was able to use David, who was just a boy, just a little shepherd boy, probably a young teenager at this moment in time. But he said, my God is able to use me as I am. And God will use you just as you are to do great things for him. But understand as he came up against that uh, giant, we know that the giant defied the armies of Israel and he defied their God. And you know what? Uh, he was in for a fight then. I mean, that really upset David because he defied the, the God of Israel. And so he engaged the fight. Um, he understood, I'm not able, but God is going to fight for me. God is able to use me as I am. I'm gonna make myself available, but it's God, the Bible says in verse number 46. He said, uh, this day will the Lord deliver thee, speaking to the, uh, to the giant, the Lord will deliver me in, uh, thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in heaven, and all this assembly shall know. The Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. You see, he understood that it was not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The battle is the Lord. And understand as you go, you don't have to be smart. You don't have to be strong. You don't have to be well-trained. You just have to be surrendered. You just have to go in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And God will fight for you. And I'm going to tell you, you have to go out there and you may be a little afraid. All right. Uh, I heard uh, John Wayne say one time what he thought courage was. Real courage, he said, is being scared to death, but mounting up anyway. Uh, just, man, get in the saddle anyway. And that's exactly what David did. He said, God's going to take care of this. Now, uh, folks, I, I think he went out in all the strength of the Lord and with courage to the battle. You might know God wants you to do it. You might say, well, I'm willing to, and I believe he can use me as I am. But you need to show up. <laughs> you need to get to the battlefront and get involved. And of course, we know that God gave the victory. The Bible tells us um, in verse 49, David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. Tells you that he was from Southern Israel and smote the Philistine in his forehead and the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. And uh, what we know is that David ran to that Philistine, took, took out the Philistine's sword and cut his head off and held it up, turned around. All the armies of, the, uh, of Israel began to cheer. And uh, man, they were excited. But now here's what happened, all right? It was a great victory in Israel that day. But all those men, all of David's brothers, every man in the army of Israel looked down there and saw that teenage boy holding up the head of that giant. You know what he, all those men thought? <laughs> I'm not going to go home to mama and tell her that a teenager did what I wasn't willing to do. And so you know what they all thought? I'm going to go get me one. I'm going to go take care of killing, killing some Philistines myself. Well, maybe I'm, I, I'm not the one that went out to kill that giant. So I'm just going to have to kill 10 of those Philistines so I can go home and tell mama. Look at what God used me to do too. It wasn't just that boy. It was all of us. And what happened was because one boy was obedient to the call of God and said, my God is able to use me as I am. A whole army was inspired to go and they put the Philistines to flight that day. Others followed along. And I'm going to tell you something. The maidens in Israel, they began to sing the praises of David. David has slain, uh, or Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And you know what? Saul became jealous in his spirit. Don't worry about what everybody else thinks. You worry about what the Lord thinks. Don't listen to the songs of the maidens and don't worry about the jealous hearts of those 
that are looking on as you accomplish great things for the Lord. You just know I'm going to stand before Almighty God one day and sooner than any of us might think and understand there'll be those that criticize the way that you did it. But you know what? I'm going to say something to you. Don't criticize giant killers until you've killed a few for your own self. You understand? Uh, listen, we, we need to engage the battlefront for the Lord and just trust him to do what we could never do. So in case you want to be used for God, be found faithful in the little things. Be obedient to the call of God. No criticism is going to come, but turn away from it and then have the conviction that God is able to use me as I am and know that God will fight for you. And as you engage the battle, the, the battle is the Lord's for he saveth not with sword and spear and realize that your exploits for God, the things that God uses lowly you to do will be an inspiration to others who will look at you and say, you know, if they, if they could do that, I believe God could use me to do that too. And what a groundswell of movement for God might take place all because you dared to say, you know, I think I'd like to do something great for God. So just in case you want to do something for God, you think about a little shepherd boy named David. I hope that you've enjoyed our study today and it's my prayer that God will inspire your heart to go out and engage his work. Don't forget to be in prayer for us. Also tonight at seven o'clock on the multicast, we have uh, our midweek service at seven o'clock. We hope to see you then. God bless you.